In this video, we're going to look at some additional strategies that you can use to tackle riddles. If you haven't watched the video on general strategies already, before you move on, make sure you get up to speed. Sometimes the problem gets more mathematical, and we can't just get away with what we have learned so far. We need some more advanced tools at our disposal. So, if you are ready, buckle up and enjoy this tour in the realm of numbers, probabilities and patterns. <laughs> The first fundamental topic is probability. This is an immense subject, and to be honest, I've never been a big fan of probability. So for my benefit, and maybe yours, I'll keep it short to three points. First, the most important thing is to always keep in mind what the definition of probability is. The ratio of the number of outcomes that produce a given event to the total number of possible outcomes. So what is the probability for the sum of two dice to be eight? Possible equally likely outcomes are 36, favorable cases are 5, so it's 5 over 36, or roughly 14%. Second, sometimes we will deal with multiple events, and most of the times they will be independent. That is, the outcome of one will not have any impact on the outcome of the second. When this happens, we can simply multiply the two probabilities together. So, what is the probability of obtaining 8, throwing two dice, twice in a row. 5 over 36 times 5 over 36, or roughly 2%. This is because the first throw did not have any impact on the second one. Third, and this is a little more subtle, sometimes we deal with the probability of an event occurring given that another event has occurred. This is called conditional probability, and we say the conditional probability of A given B, or the probability of A under the condition B. Things can change quite substantially under the conditional hypothesis. Let's consider this example. The probability that a person has a cough on any given day might be only 5%. But if we know or assume that the person is sick, then they are much more likely to be coughing, say 75%. In this case, we would have that the probability of coughing is 5% and the probability of coughing under the condition of sickness is 75%. Note that this is different from saying that the probability of sickness under the condition of coughing is 75%. In fact, the two are related by the famous Bayes theorem that states the probability of A under the condition B is equal to the probability of B under the condition A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. An important concept to master is parity. This is a specific type of invariant that we discussed in our last video, but it is so important that it's worth considering it as a separate item. The concept of parity appears in computer science, mathematics, physics and a number of other disciplines, but as far as we are concerned, we can think of it as one bit of information, for example 1 or 0, black or white, even or odd. The way of using this concept is to realize if in consecutive steps of the puzzle parity happens to be preserved, after each move something that is even remains even, or changes in a predictable way. Strongly linked to parity is the concept of colorations or graph coloring. This is something that can help even in the hardest mathematical Olympiad problems. But it is surprisingly simple. Any time we have a grid or any structure with points connected by edges, we can color these points in some suitable way. In general, you want to achieve that no two adjacent vertices are of the same color. This can be done, for example, with a square grid by coloring the nodes black and white, as in a chessboard. If then the problem is about you going around the chessboard, you know that at each move you will be either going from a black square to a white square or vice versa. This transfers the concept of parity from numbers to more complex structures. Problems that can be solved using colorations might become extremely hard if we don't use this technique. The fourth item is a very important mathematical concept, the sequence. It is defined as an enumerated collection of objects in which, unlike a set, repetitions are allowed and order matters. We can imagine it as a function whose domain is either the natural numbers for infinite sequences so that each natural number has an element of the sequence associated to, or the set of the first n natural numbers for finite sequences. 
We can then distinguish sequences that are related to previous elements, also known as recursive, and those defined only as function of their position, non-recursive. But this is a lot of theory, so let's look at some examples. Let's consider non-recursive sequences first, and let's use the standard notation a n. As an example, a n equals n squared. This defines the sequence of squares. So a1 is equal to 1 squared, which is 1. a2 is equal to 2 squared, which is 4. a3 is equal to 3 squared, which is 9, and so on. This is an infinite series. An example of recursive sequence is a n plus 1 is equal to 2 a n plus 3. In this case, we also need a starting point, as this definition only works from the second element onwards. So let's also say that a1 is equal to 0. We can now define all a n, one after the other, by recursively applying the formula. So a2 is equal to 2 a1 plus 3, that is 3. a3 is equal to 2 a2 plus 3, that is 9, and so on. When should we consider defining a sequence? The answer is any time we find ourselves associating natural numbers, for example, the years after the creation of a company, to values, for example, how much the company is worth. One of the reasons sequences are important is that they make it easier to recognize patterns. But even without considering sequences, pattern recognition is an extraordinary shortcut that can point us straight to the solution but also give us important insights on the underlying aspects of the problem. The way this works in practice is that, especially when we reduce the problem to smaller figures, numbers with an apparent order might start to line up. Things like 1, 2, 4, 8. At this point, we should be able to understand straight away what is going on. Every time I add a number, I am doubling the previous one. This also turns out to be a famous sequence, a n equal to 2 to the n. Amongst the patterns we should be able to recognize are things like squares, powers of 2 as we have just seen, prime numbers. A less obvious one could be the Fibonacci sequence. Another very important pattern that we must be able to recognize are the numbers in the Pascal's triangle. The rows are conventionally enumerated starting with row number 0 at the top. The entries in each row are numbered from the left beginning with k equals 0. The triangle might be constructed in the following manner. In row number 0, the topmost row, there is a unique non-zero entry, 1. Each entry of each subsequent row is constructed by adding the number above and to the left with the number above and to the right, treating blank entries as 0. In row number 2, we have 1, 2, 1, and so on. There are infinite properties we could list on Pascal's triangle. But one important interpretation is particularly worth mentioning in this context. The number located at row n and entry k represents the number of combinations of n things taken k at a time, called n choose k. So how many possible ways are there to draw three cards from a pack of five? We go to the fifth row, they start from zero, and pick entry number three, they start from zero, and we find ten. Number six is a quick one. Whenever you face a situation where there is a random element, think in terms of playing against an opponent in an adversarial game. And this opponent not only knows how to play the game, but also knows how you will be playing and what your strategy is, and will do everything to fight that strategy. This technique is very helpful when randomness could be to your advantage or disadvantage, but you want to focus on the worst case scenario. My last item is more of an optional one. Learn a little bit of programming. There are two reasons for this. On one hand, you can kind of cheat by programming the riddle to find the solution. Now, this obviously doesn't count as solving the riddle, but can point you in the right direction, or maybe confirm your answer. On the other hand, it also forces you to think in a different way, particularly to carefully define things to cleverly approximate when things go to infinity, and to come up with a procedural version of the riddle, a sequence of instructions. I will take this approach very rarely, and when I do, I will use Python, just because it's free and it's used widely for many purposes. But you can use any other alternative. And there you go. 
By this point, we have pretty much laid out our entire apparatus. I know, there was a lot of theory to go through, but congratulations, that's it, you got to the end. And I can promise you that many of these things will become much clearer once we put them into practice. So, once again, before you move on, make sure you go through these items once again, and you understand each of them. You will need them to attack a first riddle. If you enjoyed this video and you're ready to accept the challenge, make sure you press the like button, subscribe to the channel to get notified when our next riddle is out, and I will see you in the next video. I am Yuri and this is RiddleBear, the channel that will help you develop riddle solving skills and be able to solve riddles you didn't think you were capable of.